folks that are coming in could trickle in. We have some seats in the front. I know it's always tough to fill in the seats in the front. But we've got quite a few rows that are still open. My name is Melanie Kawano Chu, and I'm the program director at the Alliance for Peace Building. I've been at the Alliance for about five years now, and it's been wonderful to be a part of the organization, to see it grow, to see USIP um, in its home at the National Restaurant Association to its permanent home here. I mean, we're so pleased to have you all today. I appreciate that you've lasted with us for a very full day. I'm sure there are a lot of thoughts about octopi floating around in your head and Coca-Cola products and um, GE engines in there. And we'll have a chance to wrap up after this session and to talk a little bit more and hear some of your thoughts, what happened in your breakout sessions, um, but also your responses from the day and for this particular panel. Um, I wanted to thank all of you again for your support of the Alliance for Peace Building and the work that we do. And to highlight that this panel in particular is slightly unique in that about a week ago, we launched a new online publication. And uh, one of our members yesterday said, what do we need a new online publication for? And it's true, there's a lot of information out there about peace building, about conflict, quite a bit more information about war and the struggles that we all um, face and do with our day-to-day -day work. Um, but this particular publication is actually geared not for most of you that are here that are Alliance for Peace Building members, but for those of us that may not be yet deeply familiar with peace building. We have a sense that peace is good. Those of our colleagues that work in development or international affairs or even the Defense Department, but haven't looked through their profession with the peace building lens. And what we're trying to do with building peace is to show the success stories and to highlight um, the wonderful work that you all do on a day-to-day -day basis in your communities, in your offices, um, as you're emailing, doing mundane things like emailing or doing evaluations, um, the work that you actually have and the impact and the successes that you that you have every day. And as Rafif, or sorry, as um, Rafe shared this morning, sometimes we focus too much on where we have yet to succeed and what our failures are. Um, but this publication will be a talking piece for our entire field about what is working and what we do know and how peace building is contributing to larger national peace and security issues and human security at a global level. I hope our publication isn't like a FEMA report in highlighting um, the different things that are, as I've said, that are failures, but that it becomes a much more intriguing and again, a tool for all of us to be able to use. I wanted to um, go down a list of thank yous and I apologize that this is gonna take a little bit of time. There's thankfully no orchestra to, to play me off here as, as I say all of our thank yous. But as you can imagine, a publication of this nature, one that um, is free and online, has quite a few supporters and quite a few people behind the scenes that are making this happen. First, I wanted to um, thank Melanie Greenberg for her leadership and uh, for her vision for the publication, and Jessica Burns, our editor-in-chief, who's here. Um, this is, uh, publication wouldn't have happened without the two of them, without all of our working together, um, and we've really been able to work as a team. Part of that team includes some of our supporters, including the U.S. Institute of Peace and the John M. Kohler Foundation. Julie Lee Kohler, who could not be here to join us, unfortunately, because of illness, um, is a great sponsor for peace building, and she honors her brother by supporting peace, the Alliance for Peace Building, and, and many of the work um, and the, the different things that we do in our field. We have a few of our editorial board members here, and I wanted to acknowledge them, Chip House and Chris Holshek and Darinel Rodriguez. Our editorial board is um, representative of people from all over the world, and we often have Skype conversations, and we appreciate the vision and the direction that they've given us, both in this inaugural issue and the issues that'll be forthcoming every six months. I encourage you to look online to our website, buildingpeaceforum.com, where our um, advisory committee is listed, as well as the rest of our editorial board members that are not able to join us here in Washington, D.C. Um, and we've had 
fantastic design support from the USIP publications team and Openbox9, a local design firm. And I would be remiss, we wouldn't be sitting here if it weren't for our authors, both in the audience um, and here with us on the stage. Um, our panel, you may have seen some earlier uh, versions of our agenda, was supposed to be two people more, but unfortunately, um, one person from the DRC could not get his visa, and another had a medical family emergency, so they both, both George and John, send their apologies and well wishes for the publication. But I did want to note that um, Sean McDonald is here, who's featured in our inaugural issue, um, as well as Michelle Breslauer. She's here representing the Institute for Economics and Peace um, on the piece that Steve Killalay wrote on the cost of violence. So as we're enjoying our Mali and music at the end of the evening, I would encourage you to find any one of our editorial board members or our authors and to talk to them about some of their, um, the great work that they've been doing and the, the publication. Um, I won't spend too much time introducing our panelists. You all have our bios, their bios um, in your packets. Uh, I want to give us as much time for discussion and dialogue as possible. Um, the benefit of having a smaller panel is that we can have a much larger Q&A session. Um, and I'd like to draw on the expertise that's in our audience, both our members and those uh, that are deeply involved with uh, the current conflict in Mali. Um, one of our uh, features in our article, um, or in, in our inaugural issue, was Lima Guboi. And while Ms. Guboi could not join us today, we do have a video of her. Um, and she wasn't able to send some remarks, but her issue and her um, interview in our first issue, I think you'll find to be quite intriguing. So if we could play Lima's video and get that started, that would be great. Thank you. What? what? My, My story, story is not, not an ordinary, ordinary story. story. It's, it's not, not unique, unique to Liberia. Liberia. It's, it's an, an ordinary, ordinary story, and it's not an ordinary story, and it's not unique to Liberia. It's a story in Cote d'Ivoire. It's, it's a story in Congo DRC. It's, it's a story in Somalia currently. The story of any girl going through the process of war. In 2003, my story continued from 1989 to 2003. Fresh out of high school, straight A student, aspiring to be a doctor. That's the story of some girl in some place, somewhere in this world. The name Liberia had become synonymous with war. The nation had been embroiled in the worst civil wars that Africa had seen. The effect of the war on the livelihood of women and children is something that we cannot express in words. We tried, women tried in the early days of the wars to get involved. But in 2003, ordinary women who had bared or bore the brunt of the war from 1989 up to 2003 observed their children being raped, had been raped victims also, beaten, homes taken away, internally displaced, refugee, decided we would step out. And for us, we really didn't have any idea of what King and Gandhi did when they protested. All we knew, we like people would go to an insurance company in this country and say, I am doing a life insurance so that when I die, my children have something to fall back on. Or as you would do your retirement plan, when we step out, that was our plan. Survival, we needed to survive. Our children needed to see a future beyond war. And we were asking of those who were killing us three simple things. Immediate unconditional ceasefire, go to a peace talks, and please to the international community, send us an a, um, intervention force. We protested like mad people. We were all over the place, and a friend said, every time she saw us, she said, wow, these women have taken the madness pill this morning. Because we were all over the place, putting our already broken bodies out there to protest. 
In 2003, a peace agreement was signed. Now, as Ms. Kaboy stated, there is a commonality in our experiences of conflict. And for myself, that has included generational effects of conflict. I was born and raised in Hawaii, and my mom's mom went back to Japan for higher education, and she ended up getting stuck there during World War II. And so when she was done with her schooling, she decided to go live with some family in Hiroshima. And one day, she wasn't feeling well and decided not to go to work. And that was the day that the bomb was dropped. And she talked at some point in my life about what it was like to be saved by the common cold, what it meant for her to be able to still be alive and to see her grandchildren. She's still alive today in Hawaii um, because of a small incident. Whereas my dad's dad um, went to New York after being born and raised in Hawaii and decided to live the high life and got drafted into the American army. And his stories of war were so different. And yet in my mind as a child, I saw World War II as one single incident and was curious about how two different people could experience things in such a vast and different way. And yet the memories that they had with them of war, the things that they passed on and the stories they had, what was very clear was that it was a formative incident in their lives. It affected who they married. It affected how they raised their children. It affected the stories they told to their grandchildren. So as we talk today about getting out of our peace building silos, as we talk about looking at different contexts and transferable lessons, that's the point of our panel today. Looking at how what Rafif will be talking about in her experiences in Syria and what Paula, who is going to be um, coming in over the conference line, will be talking about with Colombia and the decades that it's taken them to rebuild and to look at victims' reparation. We'll be asking ourselves, how does that apply to our current conflict in Mali and the crisis in Mali? What are ways that we as peace builders can think about when the conflict will end, how it is that we'll be able to support the community um, that we'll need to rebuild? And so whether or not we're looking at Liberia or DRC or Syria or Colombia or Mali, there are ways that we should be here sharing, collaborating, and working together. And with that, I'll turn things over to Rafif. Thank you, Melanie. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you to uh, the U.S. Institute of Peace for hosting us. Uh, USIP has also been instrumental in helping Syria and Syrians develop the Day After Project, which is a transition post-Assad. And congratulations on the inaugural issue. Uh, I represent the local coordination committees in Syria and the Foundation to Restore Equality and Education in Syria. The LCC, you may or may not know of, but it is one of the largest networks of activists in Syria. What makes us unique is that we are continuing to maintain our commitment to nonviolent resistance. Uh, you have heard the, st the staggering and horrific statistics out of Syria, the 75,000 killed, the 4 million internally displaced, the 15 million people inside who are in need, and of course the now almost 1.5 million refugees in neighboring countries. Uh, what the headlines talk about is the violence, the violence between multiple warring parties who have an ax to grind, and as they grind those political axes, the casualties are primarily women and children. Uh, we, as the LCC, as civil resistance, cannot control who bears arms and who relinquishes them. But what we can do is, through our civil resistance, also attempt to establish civil society. I don't know if you're aware, but civil, in, civil society does not exist in Syria under a dictatorial regime. So what we are trying to do is establish civil society, a layer between the government and the masses, a layer of organizations that hold the future government accountable, that respond to the needs of the people. 
as we see in Syria, perhaps in Mali, in other areas of conflict, too often it is the victims of war that are forced to rebuild the country. In Syria, certainly, we feel that women are going to lead the charge to rebuilding a nation, 80% of whose infrastructure has been destroyed by the regime. So we continue to focus on strong civil society so we can develop an understanding of if we replace one dictator with another, how do we challenge the next government to do better? How do we challenge the next government to be accountable uh, and responsible? How to strengthen our economy and allow Syria finally to play a role in the international uh, community? We need to rise up to the challenge of helping civil society become so strong that we create an environment where people have a choice about picking up weapons. Certainly in Syria, we didn't see that choice last for very long. I, I assume you know that the protests were peaceful for the first seven or eight months uh, until people could no longer stand peacefully chanting Salmiye, Salmiye, while regime forces were raining bullets, first bullets, then bombs. Uh, today, Scud missiles. Uh, where we come from is the creative aspect of civil resistance. Uh, you, I don't know if you, you've heard in the news, uh, especially in the early days, where our activists went to the very top of Kasyun Mountain overlooking Damascus and launched literally thousands of ping pong balls. And on each ball were written the words freedom, democracy, and dignity for all Syrians. This remains a characteristic of the Syrian revolution, the part you don't necessarily read about in the news, the part that has nothing to do with Salafists and extremists and jihadists and foreign fighters and the regime, the part that only has to do with the commitment Syrians make every day to each other to remain undivided. Uh, other examples we've used in Syria include filling balloons with little bits of uh, confetti uh, the colors of our revolution and those balloons are launched and then exploded all over cities. Or the women who have distributed leaflets and little gift-wrapped slogans of the revolution and dropped them off at, uh, at different homes under the risk of death. Uh, our civil resistance has taken on the form now of distributing relief because distributing relief in Syria can claim your life. The regime can shoot you. Creative, nonviolent civil resistance has taken on the form of establishing workshops, particularly for women, establishing psychosocial support centers, particularly for victims of rape. As we continue, as the LCC and the Foundation to Restore Equality in Education in Syria, as we continue to try to build civil society, we reinforce civil resistance, and we try to give options to people. Now, often peace builders will say we can have nothing to do with those who bear arms, and I would disagree with that, but just a little bit. What we've been successful in doing with the LCC in Syria is to work with members of the Free Syrian Army to develop a code of conduct that is based on the Geneva Conventions and international laws and has a dialogue about treatment of political prisoners, I'm sorry, prisoners of war, how not to take political prisoners, treatment of victims, uh, treatment of cultural heritage sites. So I think, at least in the Syrian context, there is a way to have some sort of a peace-building negotiation with some of the armed elements. Um, I know you want me to be brief, and I know we want to hear about Mali. I can only hope and pray that our respective peoples uh, do achieve peace in the very near future. And uh, I'd be happy to discuss Syria more if there are any questions. Thank you. So uh, we have a, a panelist calling in from Colombia. Um, and Paula will talk a little bit about the work that they've been doing with um, victims and land reparation and, and the time that um, it's taken to get there, the decades. It, 
Paola sounds like a man. That's because her translator is male and is in the room with us. Um, so for the benefit of all of us to be able to, to really get the most out of her comments, we'll be translating her remarks. To keep talking about Siri, if you like. <laughs> I think they're just about starting. Thank you for your patience, everyone. I think they're still working a little bit. I can see them back in the control room. Hello. Yes. Great. So I think yeah, we can. She was. Okay, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Se escucha? Yes. Sorry, Charlie. Are you? Can you hear Paula? She was speaking in English, and I don't know if that was coming out. She was giving initial words of welcome in English. No. And I don't know actually who she can listen to. ¿Se escucha? Ah, ok. Es que tienen el arreglo del sonido tal que no la escuchaban en inglés. Creo que tienen que hablar directamente en español y van a escuchar la voz del intérprete, que soy yo. Thank you all for being patient as we, we work out some of these glitches. Even test runs sometimes don't always help us. So Paula's article, um, and I hope all of you will get the chance to, to read the article that she wrote herself, um, talked about the decades long, as I mentioned, struggle for um, setting up this government agency um, that's been instituted uh, to get people's land rights back to people who had been di displaced over decades of conflict in Colombia. Um, through the different iterations of the various peace treaties that were signed with almost each new president um, within uh, the country. Um, and the work that they've been doing to make sure that people either receive their land back or receive some sort of compensation for the land that was lost to them. I think the interesting parallel there is that it took a long time for that to set up. It did not happen over a couple of administrations. It didn't happen over uh, several years. But instead, they continued to build this up until it was institutionalized, until the government thought that it was important enough to heal the reconciliation and to ensure that the country was dealing with the, the hurts on both sides of the conflict, um, that it was an important enough issue for people that before they were going to get to lasting and stable peace, there needed to be reconciliation, and people's needs um, needed to be addressed. So, love a signal. Melanie and everyone yes. who's there. May I begin? Yes, please. Thank you, Charlie. Sí, puede empezar. Good afternoon. I'm very pleased to be part of this initial uh, num issue of building peace. It's a very important initiative. As Melanie was saying, the article addresses the time of the victims. Right now, Colombia, after decades, uh, of uh, victims had been relegated for decades as a result of the armed conflict in Colombia. The good news is that when we wrote this article, we were just beginning. Now we have a year of results. On the implementation of this law, which as Melanie was saying, include several components of assistance to victims, but also uh, comprehensive reparations for victims.
the possible comparisons with Mali have to do first with the uh, decades of conflict that Colombia has experienced and continues to experience. Colombia has decided to go forward with this proposal to make reparation to victims in the midst of the armed conflict. There, the issue is not uh, secession, as in Mali, but rather the opposition of the armed insurgency FARC to the current government. The important thing about Colombia's current initiative is that at the same time as making reparations in the midst of the conflict, Peace negotiations are going forward in Havana, Cuba with the FARC. The uh, uh, mission of the office that I head up is to go forward with laying the groundwork for comprehensive reparation to, for victims. as a show in the context of the negotiations with the guerrillas that victims come first. Last week we marked the National Day of Solidarity and with and memory of victims. There were demonstrations that day and throughout the week across the country on behalf of and in support of the victims of this conflict. But there was also a major march in favor of peace. And the president said on several occasions and in several contexts that the best thing that can happen for victims today and for the law on victims today is to achieve peace. This is a very important uh, indication that uh, this country, Colombia, while seeking peace and going forward with a peace process, is already making reparation to victims. What does the reparations process entail, so as to give you an idea? And looking also in the context of the Mali case. While in Colombia, the conflict is not circumscribed to an ethnic cultural matter, there are major, uh, in, in large measure, the conflict is tied to the land question, and this question in turn has a, a lot to do with minority communities in Colombia, both indigenous and Afro-Colombian. These populations live in areas that are remote areas, at marginal areas where the state historically has not had a strong presence or any presence. The policy includes specific legal provisions for indigenous peoples and Afro-Colombian peoples and communities. Uh, 
the, the baseline for reparations for these populations is to recover their culture, their traditions, and their sacred lands. These populations specifically, uh, for them, reparations has both a collective and an individual dimension, and collective reparations have been going forward in relation to these communities. There's an example of one community in far northern uh, Colombia by the border with Venezuela. There was a massacre 10 years ago of a community, a community in which uh, women were killed and the women's were the bearer of the culture in large measure and the community basically left and went to Venezuela. In respect of this community, we are putting together a plan that is going to include a collective reparation plan and specifically return of the entire community to their sacred lands. And similar examples are going forward with regard to at least 20 other communities. The basis of the processes with these ethnic minority communities is there is their participation in consulting with them as to what they see reparation to mean in their case. The other aspect of the policy is the psychosocial approach. The conflict in Colombia has left many very deep wounds, and the Colombian government is ready and willing to do its part for the, to help heal these wounds. If you read the article, you will have seen that we're talking about a population of more than 5.8 million victims, and based on extensive interviews, many require psychosocial care. And within a month, the Ministry of Health is to issue a policy allow, that is going to provide for psychosocial care and other special care for those victims in need of it. And another consideration is that since we are still in the middle of the conflict, yet we are going forward with reparations, we're looking at how we can combine humanitarian assistance, which is what one would provide in a conflict situation, with reparations. The idea is not only to overcome the vulnerabilities, but that victims feel that they are citizens of the Colombian state and that they can count on the government for assistance in putting together their life project.
I'd like to share with you two more lessons that we consider essential in comparing the Colombian situation with the situation in Mali. And the first is the value that the process accords to victims' participation in policy decision making. This is crucial since reparations are given on a one-time basis and so it, they must be significant for the community and for the individual in question. We believe that it's through reparations, especially so, uh, collective reparations, that it will be possible to uh, bring peace and to rebuild the social fabric in the communities. We feel that with this process, we are uh, fertilizing the ground, so to speak, for the actual, with this process of reparations, that is, and attending to ne victims' needs, we are uh, fertilizing the terrain for the peace that we are sure is going to come soon. And that we understand peace is not just laying down weapons, not just ending combat between the armed groups, but rebuilding citizens' trust. In, because it has been so eroded by so many years of armed conflict, and this appears to be an issue very present in Mali as well. A re rebuilding trust, as we see it, involves not just having a broad policy and political will of the government leadership and of the president of the country, but also the, having victims' participation and the participation of all of the institutions in each local and regional area that will be part of the, this process hand-in-hand -hand with the victims. In Colombia, we have 1,135 municipalities or counties. In all of these 1,135 municipalities, in 100% of them, there is a committee to implement the law that is already up and running that includes all of the different organizations and institutions and sectors that are assigned with specific tasks in the law. Of the 1,135 localities, 1,000 of them have a plan for attending to victims' needs and for assuring reparation for the coming year. We believe that with this uh, framework, we are strengthening democracy, 
strengthening trust in the institutions and helping to lay the groundwork for the peace process, which we hope will successfully culminate in Colombia. Thank you, Paula. I think to we can... conclude. <laughs> Oh, no, that is it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Well, we've had a little bit of UN flavor here with the Deputy Secretary General and then some simultaneous translations. So I appreciate all of you um, bearing with us as we did that exercise. So now we're going to turn it over to our true Malian experts, both Chance and Ambassador Kita, to be able to respond to some of these transferable lessons. We've heard about civil military engagement in a very different way than we're used to talking about it here in DC. Usually in Washington, civil military engagement means civil society, um, working with the Department of Defense here at the US government, but actually what it looks like on the ground to work with the Free Syrian Army to develop a code of contact, conduct. That's a slightly different form of civil military engagement that we see here in, in DC, as I mentioned. Themes of um, self-defined reparation that have been talked about by Paola as well as looking at programs on a national scale but that are being implemented on a local level in every single community and that being defined by each specific community. So there were quite a few things here that were mentioned and I am, am now going to turn the floor over to Chance who's the again national director of Mali World Vision for his comments and we thank uh, Chance for coming all of this way. He is just in DC for a couple of days, and so we appreciate him joining us. Thank you very much, Naomi, and thank you to everybody. Thank you to the Alliance for Peace Building for this opportunity. Uh, I, I want to qualify my remarks. Number one, I'm not an expert in Mali, and I will bow to the authority and the expertise of our ambassador here. Uh, number two, I'm not an expert in peace building. I, I feel a little bit like, uh, I don't know, I'm talking to David Beckham, and I'm supposed to teach you how to play football. <laughs> Uh, but in 1969, I sat on my father's shoulders down on the mall and demonstrated against the U.S. war in Vietnam. So peace is something that's very close to my heart. And I went to Mali a year and a half ago thinking I was going to be working in a nice, peaceful West African development posting. And, of course, the landscape has changed. So I would not consider myself a peace expert or a Mali expert, but I'm passionate about Mali. I passionately hope for peace in Mali. Uh, and I am, I'm passionate about peace in this world. Uh, I have a difficult task. I'm not an expert in Mali or peace, and yet I'm supposed to take what others have said and written and try to make sense of it for you and your experts. So I feel a little bit like a fraud, but I'm going to give it a try. Malians deserve peace, and I believe that almost all Malians desperately want peace. And I believe that, that peace takes commitment. Uh, we've seen this, we've heard this. Our, our, our uh, Lema boy said, you need to take a madness pill. And that takes commitment. Rafif had mentioned uh, the local coordinating committees and all of the meetings and all of the amazing activities that they have conducted, creative things like launching balloons and throwing ping pong balls. Uh, but it's, it's, it's also just hard work. And you can't do it if you're not committed. Paula as well. Uh, Colombia has had a very long war, and yet, Throughout it, there has been a commitment. And as, as she mentioned, negotiations are just now starting. But we have started this, this project uh, of, of restitution even before the peace talks have really began. Because we're committed, because we know it's a precursor. So I, I, I want to uh, recognize that. Um, I think you have to address the root causes. Uh, Paula mentioned that land is really the issue in Colombia. What are the root causes in Mali? I don't pretend to know, but my organization did conduct an exercise which we call Making Sense of Turbulent Contexts back in November. We saw Mali as a, as a cloudy, muddy mix, and we were trying to figure out what's going on here and what might happen. Uh, and so methodologies such as this, I think, should be used by peace builders. Because if we want to make peace, we need to understand why people are in conflict in the first place. In the case of northern Mali, surely uh, northern Malians have felt that they got a bad deal, that promises have been made that haven't been kept. 
I'm saying they felt that. I'm not saying promises were made and not kept. I wasn't there. But that's a perception, and I think we have to understand that people's perceptions are their reality and that it needs to be uh, addressed. I think people in Northern Mali need alternatives to an illicit economy. And I think Paula's article mentions the fact that Plan Colombia was an attempt to have a counterinsurgency uh, campaign and to, to go against uh, drug trafficking. And I don't think Plan Colombia is really seen as particularly successful, although perhaps it was a step needed to get to where they are now. Malians in the North want and need good government services. And it's a shame that those very services uh, were suspended because of the occupation and, and the conflict. Rafif has mentioned uh, the local coordinating committees. And indeed, I think citizen committees will be a key piece, uh, a key element of, of any peace in, in Mali. And at the same time, Paula has, has talked about the, the victims and land restitution law and the activities of the government. You, you have to look at what has happened to people. You have to look. I think we have from South Africa and onwards, uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commissions, et cetera. And Mali itself, and I, and I applaud the government, has set up uh, a commission of its own to try to address uh, these very issues. Um, many people have been hurt. There have been ethnic retributions. And, and that has to be addressed. The truth needs to be told. Uh, victims need to be honored. Maybe in, in the Malian context, it won't involve financial restitution. But people need to say what happened. And, and their story needs to, be, needs to be told. And I believe that the Malian government is working hard uh, to make sure that that reconciliation uh, can occur. I think we also need to look at what's happened elsewhere that hasn't worked well and try not to repeat the mistakes. Um, and certainly, we need to make sure to support the peacemakers. I don't think that, the, that the, the local coordinating committees could have done everything they've done without the moral support, perhaps technical support, financial support, I'm not sure. But I think that, that support is, is critical, and, and, and we need to make sure that we can find those citizens who believe in peace. We can find those members uh, of, of the government, and we can find those members even in opposition groups who would like to see peace and figure out how can, how can we support them. In the end, I think peace building is about meeting people's needs, about addressing the root causes, about creating opportunity, and about creating a shared commitment to peace. I don't know if all of those things exist yet in Mali, but I think we need to make them happen. And uh, it is hard for me to speak in, before the ambassador, but in Africa, you always let the chief speak last. <laughs> and I'm very much looking forward to, to, to hear his perspective on all that we have heard. Uh, I would again applaud the authors uh, of this inaugural edition, as well as those who all made it happen. I would thank you for the opportunity and, and look forward to your questions. Before I turn it over to Ambassador Keita, I'd like to say what a pleasure it's been for the Alliance for Peacebuilding team and the Mali Watch group um, that we've been working with with Vivian Derrick to hear your comments with us. He's been dedicated in joining us nearly twice a month to help um, the Malian diaspora and civil society organizations and NGOs here in DC facilitate dialogue, <coughs> look for joint solutions, and discuss how we can support the people of Mali. So I wanted to acknowledge your dedication and your commitment to this process and, and turn it over to you, Ambassador Kita. No, thank you so much, uh, Melanie, and uh, uh, I would like also to thank all the panelists, Rafif and uh, Chance uh, Briggs, and all uh, Mali Watch uh, members uh, present here uh, in, uh, in this uh, panel. And uh, I would like, uh, first of all, to, uh, uh, to say that uh, uh, as Chance said, uh, now one year and a half ago, uh, Mali was uh, a nice uh, and peaceful uh, country. Uh, when I left uh, Bamako to come here to Washington to take my post, it was one year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. And I left a peaceful and nice uh, country. And you also, when you are going, it was the man the same uh, situation. So what happened uh, in Mali uh, to be in this very critical and difficult situation? Mm -hmm. 
uh, today. I will try to give a response to uh, this uh, inquiry, uh, but uh, I would uh, like also to, uh, to say that uh, Rafif mentioned uh, that there is some similarities uh, between the situation in Mali and the situation in Syria. Uh, that's true uh, in some way, but uh, there is, it, the situation in the two countries is a uh, little bit uh, different. Uh, in Mali, one year and a half ago, uh, we had more than uh, 100 political parties mm. before the coup. Uh, one year and a half ago, uh, in Mali, we had a very strong civil society. Uh, maybe uh, the common uh, things between the two situations, uh, it can be the, the presence uh, on the ground uh, in Mali of armed uh, groups, uh, foreigners and fighters uh, coming from uh, other countries. We have uh, fighters from Islamist fighters coming from Algeria, Tunisia, Egypt, Sudan, uh, uh, military instructors uh, of Al Qaeda coming from uh, Afghanistan, from Pakistan, and other uh, Asian. Uh, countries, maybe this is a common position between uh, the situation between the, our two countries. Uh, another uh, factor is the financing of uh, the terrorism operations in Mali and uh, Syria. It's based on uh, the trafficking of drugs. Uh, in Mali, uh, or the, the majority of uh, these uh, armed groups, they, are, they have their financing through uh, ransoms uh, and kidnapping, uh, but also uh, through the trafficking uh, of drugs in Syria. It's coming from Afghanistan and it's confirmed. Um, and in Mali, it's coming from some uh, Latin American countries. I don't want to mention this, uh, these countries here. Uh, so uh, about the uh, the developments, the recent developments in, in Mali, as uh, you know, France had launched uh, the military operation January uh, 11 uh, against the Islamic extremists, uh, many linked to Al Qaeda and uh, EQIM, and the, the counter terrorism uh, campaign uh, led by France and its uh, African uh, allies was a reaction uh, to the various groups uh, occupying the area ranging from uh, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, EQIM, uh, the movement for oneness and jihad in West Africa, Mijawo, to Salafist uh, Ansar uh, The campaign uh, targeted these groups as a security threat, not only uh, for Mali, uh, not only for uh, West African uh, countries and uh, Africa, but also to the security in, uh, in Europe and even for, uh, ultimately, for the United States. Uh, the, the back by uh, Chadian and Malian uh, forces, uh, French troops uh, hosted the radical Islamic uh, groups from uh, the main cities uh, the three main cities in the north uh, through uh, many, and so, so many of them, they went uh, to the extreme northern part of uh, the desert and uh, continued to, uh, to withdraw in uh, the mountains uh, of uh, Adrar of uh, Ifugas. Uh, and uh, by mid-February, uh, French military uh, planners uh, were uh, reflecting on what the uh, long-term challenge uh, would be after this uh, military uh, success. Uh, they knew that the struggle uh, to hunt uh, down militant groups uh, hiding in the desert or in the Sahel bush uh, near Gao uh, would be slow and difficult, uh, sporadic attacks by suicide bombers and landmines would continue, while finding the hostages 
uh, could uh, take months. I actually, you are informed that the French hostages uh, are not on, uh, are not in Mali. Maybe they are uh, in South Algeria, uh, especially in uh, the Tindouf camps of uh, Polisario. The experiences of the last uh, six weeks have confirmed uh, this uh, analysis, and despite the killing of uh, Abdel Hamid uh, Abu Zaid, a prominent uh, commander from Al Qaeda in the Islamic uh, Maghreb QIM, other key Islamist uh, leaders are still uh, in large, including. Yad Ag uh, Ghali, leader of uh, Ansaruddin. Initially, uh, French uh, President Francois Hollande's uh, government had said that all uh, French troops would be out uh, after elections were organized. Uh, were organized. Uh, they are scheduled, these elections are scheduled uh, by the Malian government uh, on uh, next July. Uh, this week, the withdrawal began of French troops with 100 uh, French soldiers uh, going home. The French government has said uh, it will keep at least 1,000 troops in Mali on a permanent uh, basis. In fact, uh, France has concluded that it makes sense to keep 1,000 uh, troops in Mali where they will uh, presumably uh, focus largely on offensive operations against the Islamists. One such has been under was uh, Osted uh, uh, Gao over recent days. While the African forces uh, concentrate on uh, consolidating security and order in the settled areas of the north. The goal is to ensure that all the work done to break the terrorists is not destroyed. Uh, last Monday, uh, France has circulated a draft uh, UN resolution that would authorize a UN a peacekeeping force to stabilize key towns in northern Mali and help uh, promote a return to democracy and extend government uh, authorities through the conflict or uh, country. The new draft resolution uh, obtained uh, Monday authorized uh, French troops to intervene to support UN troops uh, under imminent and serious threat and at the request of Secretary General uh, of the United Nations. It makes no mention of counter-terrorism uh, operations currently being carried uh, out by France, which is likely to continue uh, doing so under an agreement with the Malian uh, government. This draft uh, resolution would authorize also uh, a UN force comprising uh, 11,200 uh, military personnel and uh, 1,440 uh, international police to, make, uh, to take over from uh, an 8,000 member African led uh, mission now in Mali on July the 1st. But uh, the resolution, it says, the UN Security Council could delay the transfer if terrorists pose a major threat in areas uh, where the UN troops would operate or uh, if international military forces are conducted uh, major combat operations in those areas. The African force uh, AFISMA, uh, Gatrick in Mali, will form the course of the proposed UN multidimensional integrated uh, stabilization mission in Mali, to be known by uh, its French acronym, uh, MINUSMA. Uh, there are more than 8,000 uh, African troops in Mali, uh, so Chadian forces have started uh, withdrawal and the resolution provides for a maximum force of 11,200 uh, military person uh, with, as I mentioned, 1,440 uh, uh, police. Uh, MINUSMA, the new force, uh, will have an initial uh, mandate of 12 months. Uh, it will help to retrain uh, Malian security forces and bring order uh, back to towns under government control again. It will also play 
a key role in political efforts to rebuild the Malian state. The resolution also calls for tangible achievements in the political efforts Mali's transitional uh, authorities uh, have voted to hold presidential and uh, legislative elections before the end of, uh, of July. Mali's government and France wants to have a vote on this draft resolution before the end of the month, and that seems to be uh, our targets. Uh, the Malian crisis is a very complex issue. Uh, we know that uh, there is no uh, magic formula to resolve it, but we uh, suspect, we are sure, and uh, this is uh, our uh, determination that the international community uh, pool on, of options is larger than uh, is generally thought. In this sense, uh, I'm very hopeful that uh, our panel uh, is the ideal opportunity to map out the course, examine some options, uh, compare experiences, and learn some uh, lessons from uh, other uh, countries uh, like uh, Syria, Colombia, or uh, other uh, crisis uh, places in this world. This panel is taking uh, place in the uh, belief that difficult decisions uh, the kind of which we will face uh, next days in the Security Council uh, for many uh, issues can in future be taken on a more differentiated, uh, creative and informed basis. Uh, with this in mind, uh, I would like again to uh, thank uh, Melanie uh, so much for her very kind uh, introduction and uh, thank all uh, the participants and uh, special thanks to uh, Mali Watch uh, and the Peace uh, Building Institute for all uh, their commitment and support for the resolution of the situation uh, in Mali. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ambassador, for that, that update and that look back and, and chance um, for your remarks as well. Um, the last year and a half, though you both have basically switched places, have been very transformative, I'm sure, and, and very different. So Chance had brought up some issues about um, conflict analysis. The ambassador was talking about interna pooling international community and support. Um, I wanted to open up the conversation uh, to you all, not just your questions, but your comments as well. There are pending elections, and I know quite a few of our members um, deal with preventing elections related violence and that you all um, are experts in conflict assessment and what that looks like. So please feel free to make comments as well as questions. We'll take three at a time. If um, as you raise your hand, you could identify yourself and what organization you're working with and if you have your question is aimed at a particular panelist. So we have one up here, one down here and then and one back up there, Molly. The woman in the white scarf, right, thank you. Hi, um, my name is Talia Haggerty. I'm a recent graduate from the Center of Glo for Global Affairs at New York University. And my research has looked a lot at illicit economic activity, so I was wondering if um, all of you could say more about how um, the illicit economy is potentially, um, the dynamics of how it's interacting with the situation in Mali and in Syria, if that's applicable, um, and what the international community can do to address this. Thank you. Great. Okay. Take a question here. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this question is to Mr. Ambassador. Uh, my name is Mabuba Saraj, and I'm representing the Afghan Women Network mm -hmm. in Afghanistan. Um, I saw a resemblance very much between Mali in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm but kind of in the beginning stages. So what I really would like to say, maybe this is a comment, or maybe at the same time could be a question, is the fact that uh, in case of having any kind of a 
meetings or reconciliation or getting together for peace or whatever you want to call it, uh, I hope that you will not make the mistake that the Afghans did. And the mistakes that we did was the fact that when we had the Bonn conference and everybody got together around the table, the ones that we did not get at that table were the Taliban. Because it is always hard and difficult to get the bad guys, so-called. So, and if you are really going to have any kind of a discussion about this, I hope you don't, in, you, ha you don't exclude the bad guys. In other words, you have to really get them around that table and make them responsible, hear them. I think that will be my suggestion, learning from Afghanistan as a lesson learned. Thank you. Thank you. And then one last question here. Uh, my question was for the ambassador. With regards to the upcoming elections in July, could you speak a little bit to the way in which you would recommend or, or prescribe ways to unify the North and the South, especially given the fact that currently there's a demarcation line that the French are maintaining right above Segu and Mopti. Um, there are no banking institutions in the North. There's a historical lack of government support and way in which to facilitate buy-in to that process. Thank you. So Ambassador Kute, I think, all three questions had some element for you, so if you'd like to go first. Okay, th thank you so much, uh, Melanie. Um, uh, about the, the, uh, the dialogue and the uh, uh, reconciliation process uh, in Mali, it, uh, the process is uh, already engaged uh, with the uh, nomination of the uh, members and the head of this uh, uh, dialogue and reconciliation uh, commission and uh, the Malian government uh, thought that uh, this uh, dialogue and reconciliation uh, process must be uh, extremely inclusive of all uh, the northern uh, communities of uh, the country uh, including in particular the uh, Tuareg uh, communities. As you know, since the independence of Mali, uh, some uh, Tuareg uh, communities have had uh, legitimate uh, demands of uh, development or uh, integration in the Malian institutions and in the army or uh, in other development uh, processes uh, in the country. Those are the legitimate demands and the Malian, of, uh, the Malian government is committed to discuss and to find solutions for all the legitimate uh, demands of all communities in Mali, not only uh, the uh, Tuaregs, but the Arab uh, communities in the north, the Pearl communities in the north, because the north, uh, it's not only exclusive for the Tuaregs. There is many other populations. So the North has its own problems of development and the Malian government is committed uh, to uh, put all of this on the table and to discuss uh, entirely with all uh, the communities in, uh, in the North. Uh, but there is some criteria and some conditions for any uh, dialogue with the armed groups in the north. As you know, uh, MNLA, the uh, National Movement for the Liberation of Azawad, who proclaimed uh, a state, what they call the state of uh, Azawad, uh, have to be uh, included also in this uh, dialogue and reconciliation uh, process, even if MNLA is not the representative of uh, Tuaregs, because 24 uh, hours ago, there is a new uh, movement of uh, Tuaregs was uh, created uh, in uh, Bamako, uh, including an uh, ex-prime uh, minister, uh, Ag Amani, who is uh, Tuareg, uh, with a very large uh, community Tuareg, uh, of Tuaregs uh, in all the parts of Mali. They created a new uh, movement of uh, Tuaregs in the country. And even here in uh, the United States, uh, maybe you heard about uh, this uh, appeal uh, and petition uh, initiated by uh, the Tuaregs in the United uh, States uh, 
uh, not recognizing uh, the revendications and the demands of the uh, MNLA for uh, a state independent state uh, on Mali and reaffirming uh, their uh, commitment for the sovereignty and the territorial integrity of Mali. It was launched from here, from the United States, and there are thousands of Tuaregs uh, through the world who signed uh, this petition sent to uh, the interim president of the Republic of Mali. So there is, uh, uh, the, there is some criteria and conditions uh, to be uh, in, uh, an actor in uh, this uh, reconciliation and dialogue uh, commission uh, to recognize the uh, sovereignty and the territorial integrity of, my, of Mali uh, to uh, not to have or to drop all links with uh, Al-Qaeda and uh, Equiam. So there is this main uh, conditions for any armed groups. Uh, already for uh, Ansar al-Din of Yad Aggali, this question is resolved. Uh, uh, Ansar al-Din is mentioned uh, on the terrorist uh, lists in the United States and, uh, and uh, the list of the United Nations uh, also. So uh, Ansar al-Din is excluded from any uh, dialogue, even if Yad Aggali is Tuareg uh, also. So we don't have to make this confusion between uh, Tuaregs uh, and uh, other communities living in, uh, in the north. About the elections, the elections, uh, interim president of uh, Mali uh, already uh, proposed to the government and the uh, parliament, Malian parliament, adopted um, a roadmap about the, uh, uh, the transitional uh, period uh, in Mali. This transitional period uh, will uh, take an end on uh, July, on the end of July. The elections uh, are scheduled the first tour on the 7th of uh, July. The second one, if there is a second uh, one, it will be on the 21st. Uh, and the new president, elected president of Mali, will be uh, inaugurated on the 31st of July. So this is the calendar of uh, events for the elections. Uh, the, the, uh, actually, there is no uh, financing problem uh, for uh, the um, uh, financing uh, for the financing of the electoral uh, uh, process. There is some technical uh, uh, problems uh, to held in uh, parallel. Uh, the two elections, the presidential and the legislative one, uh, but uh, we will start by the uh, presidential elections process and later uh, we will organize the legislative, uh, legislative uh, elections. About the refugees and uh, the international, uh, inter, uh, in, um, the IDPs, uh, they will be. Uh, also, uh, they will participate to, uh, to, um, to, to the process. They, will, they have the right to vote uh, 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 from the, the camps of refugees in the neighboring countries or uh, inside uh, Mali in the uh, camps of uh, the IDPs. And we are taking, uh, actually, or uh, necessary uh, measures to uh, allow uh, the refugees and uh, IDPs to uh, participate. Some security problems uh, are still uh, going on, especially in the region of Gao uh, and somewhere in Tombuktu, but uh, we are hoping that all these questions, uh, security questions, will be resolved as uh, soon as possible uh, to uh, respect uh, the uh, calendar of uh, the elections. The elections are extremely important, not only because it's a, a demand of the international uh, community, but the Malian people uh, also uh, was prepared one year and a half ago for uh, elections. We need these elections, and we are uh, very highly appreciating all what the United States and the international community are doing actually 
in support for uh, the uh, organization of, uh, of this election, presidential elections, especially uh, next uh, July. Thank you so much. Thank you. Did you want to answer the question about illicit economy in Syria? And there were, I think, a couple of questions rolled up into that. Uh, so I can tell you that in Syria, for some 50 years, uh, regular civilians became accustomed to knowing that anywhere between 60 and 80 percent of the national budget was allocated to weapons. These weapons were ostensibly to help us in our resistance to Israel, and what we see today is that those weapons were stockpiled to be turned on the civilian population. Uh, before the uprising began, uh, Bashar al-Assad had been promising economic reforms for 11 years. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not talking major overhauls of a failed economy. We're talking about uh, lowering the price of fuel, uh, lowering the price of bread, making available more foodstuffs for a starving people. You had, in, in combination with this drought over the past several years, which pushed people from the agricultural areas into the more urban areas, notably Damascus, where the population almost doubled. And so what you have is this seething unhappiness, <laughs> this, seeth, this desire to finally see these uh, economic reforms implemented, and this golden boy of a president who was bestowed upon us finally uh, make his commitments come true. Uh, now, you also know that in Syria, the business community is very much tied with the regime, or mo most of the larger businesses. Uh, you may have seen the New York Times article about Rami Makhlouf, the, the president's cousin, who is known as Mr. 10% in business circles, because with any institution that is established, Rami Makhlouf would extract at least 10%, and that would go back into the Assad coffers. Mm -hmm. uh, with any non-governmental organization that might be established, it would be a governmental organization because the law required that uh, a member of the Ba'ath party be assigned to the board of directors. And of course, in Syria, you never knew which uh, member of the NGO was a member of the Muhabarat. Again, uh, always opportunities to extort money. So what Syrians have lived with for the past 50 years is an economy of corruption, of cronyism, of nepotism, of favoritism. Now, in addition, with all of this, you have instances where the sons of the former vice president, Abdul Halim Khaddam, uh, were actually being paid to import nuclear waste and bury it in parts of Syria. When people know about this, the unhappiness levels tend to rise. We know that another son of Abdul Halim Khaddam imported rotted meat because Western countries were trying to get rid of it. So he thought it would be a great business venture with the Makhlouf family to bring it into Syria and sell it on the, on the market for average Syrians. So you have all of this bubbling and bubbling and bubbling. And then in Syria, on you know one fine day, women are conducting a sit-in demanding that their children be released from jail, and the regime soldiers say, don't worry about your sons. We can help you make new ones. And with those fateful words, they're boom. That, that almost boiling pot spilled over. And that's how things started. Uh, you asked about what the international community can do. If I knew that, <laughs> if I knew that answer, uh, the international community is providing a considerable amount of assistance, but of course it's not enough to take care of so many millions of people in need. The international community is uh, refusing to provide defensive weapons to the Free Syrian Army, so we cannot effect a shift in the balance of power. Uh, the international community is providing non-lethal assistance, which may or may not uh, eventually help us overcome not only a murderous regime, but now even more extremist elements that resort to all kinds of acts of terrorism. So I don't know what more the international community can do short of actually uh, adding to the weapons involved in the Syrian revolution. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It looks like we have several more questions, so why don't we take one more round. We have Peter, Monica, and then this gentleman in the front here. 
Thank you, Melanie, uh, and thank you for a very interesting uh, panel. Uh, my name is Peter van Tau. I'm with the uh, Global Partnership for the Prevention of Armed Conflict. Um, my question is, again, alluding a bit to the Mali situation. Um, the ambassador, I think, explained quite well uh, a number of uh, difficulties in organizing the election. The election is supposed to take place at the end of July. Today is the 16th of April, so that is three months from now. And as Melanie said, I think in this room there will be a lot of people who in one way or another have experiences in elections, organizing elections and preventing violence around elections. It is indeed a massive challenge. I mean, the voter education in the North, the IDPs, the resourcing necessary for it. Um, so I think that should make us think twice already. So while you're having difficulties in pulling off the election technically, my question is, is it desirable to have an election in July? Because as you said, um, and as also Mr. Briggs said, what the country needs is a process of dialogue and mediation between different groups you know, who have felt excluded in one way or another. Um, and what is going to happen in Mali if we rush in the elections now is political parties campaigning, dividing the country. Um, so how do you reconcile that? And you see that actually already happening, political parties starting to forward their candidates. Um, if, how, I, you know, how do you match the two? That's my question. Great, we'll take this gentleman here. I'd like to thank, I'd like to thank the panel for sharing the stories and analysis. Um, and my question is directed towards the ambassador. My name is Eric Wolf, and I'm an analyst at the Center for Advanced Defense Studies. But before that, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Mali from 2010 to 2012. We were evacuated shortly after the queue. Um, but my question pertains to an agreement in the north. As you know, throughout Mali's independence, there have been several agreements with the Tuareg populations and with the northern populations, trying to integrate them into the army and address some of their grievances. So my question is, if there's an agreement reached, what is fundamental to this agreement to avoid you know, this conflict arising again in the future? Thank you. Thank you. So Monica and then Sarah, there's one more question down here in the front with Vivian. So um, my name is Monica Kirka, and I, um, I'm with the Center for Citizen Peace Building in UCI and on my own Court of the Pax, Pax Manifesto. And I was uh, last uh, month in, um, in Gaziantep working with the Center for Civil Society and Democracy. And um, I was training humanitarian activists, and some of them were media workers in the LCC. And I was happy to know at that moment that there is um, a code of conduct um, uh, for the LCC as far as their practices. Um, then I uh, was having lunch with uh, Razan Ghazawi in Los Angeles last a uh, couple weeks ago, and I asked her, you know, the media, because she does media watchdog, does the media have a code of conduct? Um, having watched and having retweeted and, and, and work on that level, I see um, a lot of uh, maybe uh, sectarianism and maybe um, I wouldn't qua maybe qualify it in, in peace building terms. Um, some of what's, what's, I mean, what else are you gonna do with war? So I'm wondering is, does, is the media, the LCC's media a sector have a code of conduct? Is there any training happening? Um, we had some reporters from the LCC, from local councils. Um, I, and is there any plans for that? And well, you know, what does it need? Thank you, Vivian Lowry Derrick um, from Mali Watch. And first of all, I really have to thank um, Melanie and the Alliance for Peacebuilding for a, an extraordinary partnership. Um, you have really expanded the way that groups like this think about looking at conflict in its resolution. And Ambassador Keita, you have just been the pivot, as we say at our meetings at this. So thank you very much for us seeing this, this meeting. It's really the essence of civil society cooperating with government to secure peace. Uh, I have a two-part question. The first is on the timing of the elections. Um, given what one of the previous questioners um, asked and the difficulty there is always in just getting the paraphernalia of elections together, the polls, the registers, the polling places, et cetera, plus the fact that um, the Malian constitution, I believe, says that you have to have 
voting in all parts of the country. And I'm wondering, um, Ambassador Kata, if these conditions are not um, ready in time for the sequencing, what are the triggers that Mali and its, um, and its partners would think about for postponing until such time as those factors um, were in place for like a, um, a month or a couple of weeks or whatever it would take? And then my second question is about, um, for Rafif and Ambassador Keita, about post-conflict, because we're talking now, uh, hopefully, about resolution of both conflicts in the near term, but we have to be turning our attention to what do we do w among groups of people that have these various points of view, and how do we reconcile them? So I'm wondering if there's been any conversation with um, potential governments about their commitment to that kind of rock rib primary consideration of restoring social cohesion. Thank you. Thank you. Did you want to go first, Rafi? Oh, sure. <laughs> are you still talking? So, all right. So first we started with, does the LCC have a code of conduct? Uh, the LCC media team has a code of conduct in the sense that there are rules we follow. We don't report on something if we've not documented it and verified it. And what that means in Syria, uh, for example, when we report on the daily death toll, it means that we literally have activists going door to door, sometimes getting shot as they try to verify the death toll. It means we interview uh, grieving families who have just lost their son or daughter. Um, so we do have rules about how we report our news. In terms of training, especially earlier on in the, in the Syrian revolution, we held many, many workshops in Cairo and in Istanbul to help our activists get training in journalism, what journalism means, what is it to be objective uh, and not over-report or under-report or, or give in to propaganda. Um, now we're trying to have our activists train each other inside. Again, this is fraught with challenges, as, as you may or may not know. Any gathering of over five people requires government permission in Syria, so it's very difficult to put together a workshop of, of a, a training workshop. Uh, now, what my foundation is doing, the, the Foundation to Restore Equality in Education, we are also providing English language training to media activists when they can get on Skype. And so we're trying to help them better communicate news of what's happening on the ground. I hope that answers your question. And, and just for everybody, CCSD in Gaziantep is a brilliant organization and should be supported. And I thank you for, for participating in the training there. Um, in terms of post-conflict, uh, yes, Syrians are very optimistic that the end of the conflict is near. But we also have to put on our, our realistic hat. Uh, what we have done is to put together the day after project uh, facilitated by the US Institute of Peace and other international donors. And what we've done is treated multiple transition subjects like constitutional reform and electoral systems design, rule of law, transitional justice, economic restructuring and social policy, uh, many concepts that Syrians are entirely unfamiliar with after the 50-year Ba'ath Party rule. Um, one of the things that is very important about the day after document is that we are not calling for debathification. We've learned lessons from Iraq, and I think maybe this ties into the Afghanistan example a little bit, in that we cannot immediately remove all members of the Assad regime. And we have to keep in mind that not all government workers are, government, are regime supporters. And so one of the things we've been stressing in our series of recommendations in the day after is to not rush to debathify. Also, we are focused on issues of transitional justice. And I think somebody said achieving peace is not just when the weapons mm -hmm are down. It, it's how you look at different communities. In Syria's case, how do you treat our cultural and ethnic mosaic? How do you ensure, uh, at least, how do you minimize any sort of revenge killings? How do you treat the notion of gender equality, uh, particularly as more extremist elements find their way into Syria? 
I hope that answers. I could go on about the day after for hours. But <laughs> you guys can it's talk as um, we listen to Molly and music. So I'll turn it over to the ambassador and then Chance, if you have any closing words. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Melania. Three questions here. Uh, the election uh, process, uh, dialogue conditions, and the agreements, peace agreements with uh, Tuaregs and uh, in the northern part of Mali about the election uh, process. Elections, as uh, you said, it's a very uh, important issue. After it's desirable by all uh, Malians on a political and social uh, level. It's also a demand of the international community to elect a new uh, government, a credible one, uh, who can be the interlocutor for the international uh, community. As you know, with the coup d'etat, uh, the bilateral cooperation between Mali and other countries was suspended. Uh, this is an uh, automatic decision which is taken on the African level and everywhere uh, in the world. Since that you have a coup d'etat, you must restore as a uh, constitutional uh, order. So the Malian people, the Malian uh, government needs to reestablish uh, its uh, bilateral uh, cooperation with all the countries uh, in the world, uh, starting by the, uh, by the, by the United uh, States. So it's a very important issue that we have to, uh, and still, till now, we are in the frame uh, of the possible uh, timing to organize these elections. Uh, only Monday, uh, the uh, UN representative, uh, resident representative in Bamako, uh, concluded with the government the agreement about the uh, organization of the elections. It was only uh, last Monday. So we are in the frame of uh, the timing which can permit to uh, the Malian authorities and the uh, international partners uh, to organize these uh, elections. We have a very strong support uh, from USAID, uh, from the European Union, uh, from the African Union, and uh, ECOWAS for the organization of uh, this election. And we are committed uh, to do it, to get these uh, credible uh, authorities uh, in in Mali, about the uh, about the conditions of uh, the conditions of uh, the uh, of the dialogue, as you know, the the uh, national uh, reconciliation and dialogue uh, it will be a very long process. We are starting it uh, now with the establishment of the uh, of the commission, but it will be a very long uh, process, and normally. It's uh, an issue which must be handled uh, and, uh, and directed by the new authorities, uh, elected authorities, authorities after, uh, after July. So we're putting the basis of uh, this uh, dialogue and reconciliation, uh, national reconciliation, and it will be pursued after that uh, by the, uh, the new elected uh, Malian, uh, Malian authorities, but it will, it will be a very long process because it's a very uh, situation, uh, very critical situation, and with the coup d'état and uh, the other side, this all these uh, 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 disasters made by the armed groups, the Islamist groups in the Malian society, especially in the north, there is many f uh, frustrations and uh, a lot of uh, ethnic uh, tensions between uh, the Malians, especially in the north, and we have to resolve all that. And it, it will take time, exactly uh, like in any other uh, crisis situations. Uh, through uh, through the world. Uh, finally, about the agreements, we, uh, we, we, we conclude, the Malian government concluded many agreements, uh, starting by 1995 agreements, what we call uh, Algiers uh, Accord with, uh, with, with the Tuaregs in the north. It was focused on the integration 
of the Tuaregs in the army, in the political uh, institutions, uh, and in public services. Uh, so uh, they were included in, uh, and uh, uh, with the implementation, but there is many lakes in this, uh, in this Algier uh, uh, accord, uh, w w which we, we can consider it as a, a source of uh, this new uh, rebellion, what we, uh, which we are assessing in the north uh, part of Mali, because the integration of Tuaregs in the army, uh, these people were, were not qualified, most of them, but they, uh, they became commanders of uh, the Malian army in the north, and with the attacks in the, on the 17th of uh, January, uh, 2012, all these people, they deserted. They went with Ansar al-Din, with al -Qayyam. So we had this uh, uh, catastrophic situation of the Malian army uh, in the north. And this is one of the lessons uh, what uh, uh, Niger uh, learned from uh, the situation uh, in Mali. So for the future, we, uh, we have to find uh, other basis for uh, this uh, uh, integration of our brothers and sisters Tuaregs in uh, in the north uh, in the in all the development uh, process. But we, uh, even this, it will be based on the reconciliation and dialogue uh, process uh, to be engaged uh, very soonly. And it will take time after that to assure this real reconciliation between all uh, the members of uh, Malian uh, family. Thank you. Uh, as I said before, in, in, in Mali, I would never speak after the chief. And a representative <laughs> of the Malian government is as close as I have as a, to a chief. But I will dare, because we're on US soil, to say a, a few words. And I hope you'll forgive me, Mr. Ambassador. Um, there was a question about the illicit economy. And I think we must recognize that in places where there has not been much development, the illicit economy tends to thrive. And it is understandable. People are looking for ways to feed themselves. People are looking for ways to help their families. Uh, and so I think we saw, even with this conflict, that the well-funded armed opposition groups were able to recruit some of their fighters who were really propelled towards that for economic reasons and not out of ideology. Uh, I've mentioned before that I think the key to peace in the North will be development. There is a perception about many that the development hasn't happened. The ambassador himself said that, that, that there has been a lack of the type of development that's needed in the North. Um, and there is a connection to elections. As the ambassador said, there is an expectation on the part of the international community that elections happen in Mali. It is not just that Malians desire elections, as he said, but there is an expectation. And there is some conditionality. By, by, by law, the US government cannot provide much development assistance to Mali, and many other governments have similar laws, until there is a legitimately elected government. Humanitarian assistance can flow, and that's a good thing. And I commend the US government for that as a humanitarian actor, but we need long-term development. The elections must happen, and they will allow for legitimacy, and they will allow for more development money to go to Mali, and hopefully it will be well spent, and it will be part of the solution to keeping a lasting peace and honoring the promises that have been ma made in the past. There was a mention of Afghanistan, and uh, I'm, I'm speaking in my personal capacity, not as a World Vision employee, but I think, I think we have to recognize that to have peace you have to talk. It's one thing if my wife and I get in a fight, and we don't talk, and eight hours later we've calmed down, and <laughs> we start talking again, and, and the peace is there, because we have high levels of trust. But we're not talking about relationship like the relationship I have with my wife. And so I believe, honestly, that there will, have, there will be a need to talk. Every conflict that has ever been solved, talking has been involved. World War II, there was a military victory on, on route, but you still had to sit and talk with the, with the other side. The IRA and, and Great Britain, long conflict, but in the end, they had to sit. 
Sudan, 80 years of conflict, they had to sit with the Taliban. I, I think the US government doesn't want to admit it, but somehow they're going to have to talk. And so my guess is in Mali, they will, we will need to find some way. And it is a challenge when you have groups that have been named as, as, as terrorist groups by the US government, by the United Nations, et cetera. It's hard to feel like you can legitimately sit at the same table with them. Uh, but yet they do represent some factions in, in the country. Uh, and while they occupied the north, uh, there were some citizens who felt that they had restored order and, and, and put some things in place that are currently not in place. Uh, please don't misunderstand this as, as any defense of the armed opposition groups. Absolutely not. But I think uh, one thing that I really love about your country, Mr. Ambassador, Malians will talk and talk and talk and talk it through. And as you said, it will take time. Malians are very good at talking and talking until it's resolved. And it may take months or it may take years, but that's what it's going to take. There's a wonderful tradition in your country. You can go into a Malian village, just about any village, and you'll find something that looks like a shelter, some, some poles or beams. And then on top, you'll, you'll usually see some grain. And it's like, like a roof, yeah? but it, no walls. And the roof is fairly low. And People go in there to have conversations. And when you get in and you're sitting down there, you're sort of a little bit huddled. And the roof is right above your head. And there's a good reason for that. So that if you get angry, when you start to stand up, you're going to bang your head and hurt yourself, right? And so Malians know the value of, of talking and talking it through. And I don't think that at I as American have any right to tell Malians about that. They know. They have that capacity, and they will find their Malian solution. Mm -hmm. They will find their Malian solution, but we need to support them. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I think it was a wonderful conversation today. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
the thing that what you can do is engage, learn, uh, and, and adapt. Um, so I think, I think we've got a lot of really good food for thought. I hope that you all have some ideas and some, some things that have inspired you to, to do the work that you do to build these relationships and to work together uh, more effectively. But mostly, I want to continue the conversation while we listen to Molly and music and, and tomorrow as we, we, we have our opportunity to network and work together uh, with each other. So thank you, but let me hand it over to Melanie. Thank you, everyone, for stepping out of your own comfort zones today. Uh, I've, I've spent the day thinking about Rafe's illustration of the amphibian coming out of the water onto land. And I think we found ourselves in that space today, um, thinking about conflicts in a new comparative way, looking at both the positive and negative spaces, and um, you know, trying to talk with people perhaps we haven't talked with before. So I want to thank all of you, and um, I'm not sure they're in the room right now, but especially to thank uh, Melanie Kwano Chu, who runs all of our programs at the Alliance for Peace Building. And I think that the um, product you saw today of Building Peace is a result of her vision. And Jessica, are you still here? Yes, and Jessica Burns, our editor-in-chief, who was able to shepherd these very different authors and lead them through the conclusion and to build this, this wonderful, uplifting, concrete story of peace building. So thank you to you, Jessica. And Emily, who I don't think, oh, there you are up there. Just Emily, to thank you again that none of this would have been possible today without you, so thank you. And finally, to our host at USIP, just we can't imagine a more wonderful environment for the work we did today. And also for allowing us at 5 o'clock to have a concert. We had to work through the rules because we didn't want to disturb any of the researchers. But at 5 o'clock, we're allowed to raise the roof. <laughs> so please stay with us tonight uh, for a concert and drinks and just some time to mingle. Tomorrow morning, we'll be at NAFSA, which is now an organization whose acronym doesn't mean anything, but it's, it's the world's largest organization for cross-cultural exchange. Uh, one of our members and have graciously offered us their offices at 1307 New York Avenue. And finally, we have surveys. Please do fill them out today. Do it after a glass of wine, but we really try to be evidence-based in our practice here and to learn for next year about your, um, your thoughts about today. So once again, thanks to all of you. I'm sorry, what, Peter? Yes. Oh, thank you for reminding me. Um, at 6.30, a few AFP staff, including me, will be at our, our new offices at 1726 M Street on Northwest. That's on M between 17th and Connecticut. So please feel free to stop by, see your offices, make yourselves at home. Um, and finally, we have a wonderful write-up from this morning's business and peace building panel that we had rapporteurs in the small groups who put together a one-page takeaway. So we'll have those available outside just to help consolidate our thinking in this really exciting new area. So thank you. <laughs>